Kia ora, welcome, bienvenidos, Juani, to IBM Systems Back to School 2020. So, uh, as you might know, uh, our TechU events, the events that we run globally, uh, were cancelled uh, in the first half of this year. So, we came up with a small version of it, which we call it IBM Systems Back to School. So, uh, if, just in case you, you may ask yourself why you guys are here, so this this is why. So the the idea, uh, uh, Barry, if you can go to slide two, please. Um, so the idea behind this this event series is trying to show what is new in IBM systems, uh, what does make sense for you to think about it, and mainly how. IBM transform your business requirements into IT solutions. So that's that's our main intent. Um, so who we are? So just just in case you you don't know us yet. So those are the speakers for these technical sessions. Of course, uh, just like today we have special guests, just like uh, Mr. Andrew Greenfield from IBM USA. So welcome, Andrew. Um, so first of all, uh, um, and uh, hosting the event today, we have Barry White, uh, Master Inventor at IBM. You have myself uh, as a Client Technical Specialist uh, for IBM uh, Asia Pacific uh, with the main role of uh, supporting clients in New Zealand sometimes in APEC in um, temporary engagements. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Pat Alton, uh, which is also um, also here today. Um, <clears throat> he's an IBM Z client technical specialist in New Zealand, so it's a similar uh, role as mine, but for another product solution, which we call it the mainframe, the System Z, our Linux one. Uh, and we have Mr. Andrew G. Uh, which is uh, the client technical architect for New Zealand and also a specialist for power systems. So we uh, combine in eight sessions together to present to you uh, an unique content that you may uh, find interesting. Uh, so those are the eight sessions that we're going to run. Uh, the first one we are running today, it is a y, uh, IBM Flash system with Barry White. Next week, uh, Wednesday, 4 p.m., we changed the time uh, just to accommodate uh, our friends from Asia Pacific, uh, especially from India to, uh, 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 and a bit west. Um, also, um, after Power Systems uh, uh, session, we will have another Another session with Andrew G, which is boosting uh, your SAP HANA platform uh, using the Power Architecture uh, systems, and then we we go back to uh, to Mr. Uh, Barry White uh, um, sharing with us some tips and tricks and how to monitor and and troubleshoot your storage performance. Uh, after that, we go back to a session where we. We intend to uh, uh, mix a little bit of storage and power because everybody talks about um, AI, and uh, but sometimes people forget that to run a, a successful AI initiative, you need to have uh, an infrastructure or information agenda, as as per se. Uh, and then uh, we will have our six. Uh, um, session which is uh, about Linux One. Uh, for those that doesn't know, it is our um, Linux uh, mainframe solution. We, uh, instead of, for example, instead of having uh, a certain amount of uh, physical uh, Intel boxes uh, to run your virtual environment, how about consolidating all of them uh, into a single Linux one box. So Mr. Pat Alton is uh, responsible for that session. So hopefully uh, you guys will love that. And then the, the two last sessions is with myself, uh, where I will run through our IBM Spectrum storage brand from the data management perspective in session number seven. And finally, uh, from the data protection point of view, on the session number eight. So that's that's basically our agenda. Uh, 
so hopefully to see you guys in all the events. This is this is uh, for you. So questions, uh, uh, concerns, comments. Uh, want to build uh, an actetry uh, um, and uh, with with our solutions and doesn't know how to start. Just uh, reach us. We are more than happy to help. Okay. Uh, moving on. So. Uh, I was here and I just disappear uh, with you, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barry White. Thank you, Emilio. Um, thanks for the introduction. If everyone just bears with me one second, because Andrew's poll question is covering part of my screen. There we go. Get rid of that. So um, welcome to the first session um, of the Back to School series. Um, and what we thought we would do here is not so much we spend a lot of time doing what's new, what's the greatest, latest and greatest things that we've done um, and often forget to actually go back to basics and, uh, and sort of talk to people about the, the key value and the, um, the kind of starting point of why would you pick an IBM Flash system um, as your storage solution. So this is really intended not only for people who are already maybe using our products, um, but also for those uh, those of you out there that maybe don't know about IBM's flash system, what is it, how does it work, um, and why would you think about putting one into your system? So before we do that and talk about um, the basics of it, it's worth taking a step backwards um, and kind of looking back over the last 25, 30 years of IBM storage and how we've got to where we are today. Um, this could actually be a kind of almost map of my career in some respect as well. Um, in the for the the last twenty four years, um, I have been working pretty much full time um, through a large part of that through the development team based in the UK, where a lot of these products um, were born or developed in part. So going way back to ninety six, um, IBM introduced the first two way RAID adapter. Now it doesn't sound much, but back in the day actually having two servers connected to each other and able to talk to each other, sharing the same set of storage was quite a big thing. And so that SSA 20 um, or that Saratoga card, that actually was launched about two months after I joined IBM uh, in 96. And that was the team that I joined. And so I spent a lot of time working on that serial storage architecture. Again, quite innovative at the time, having serial disk loops where you could communicate um, between the paths in between each of the disks as well as from the adapters themselves. So why am I telling you about that? That's all very interesting. Well, that then became the basis of the ESS, the original Shark, the DS8000 as we know it today, which is our kind of mainframe attached storage and high, very high end um, kind of monolithic storage solution. So the first products of those came out in 99, um, essentially in the, in the DS8000 that we know today. Um, those kind of started and evolved um, from that SSA architecture as the disk technology behind there. The team in the UK, um, obviously moving on from as, as fibre channel, obviously beca became a big thing. Uh, we kind of moved and looked and saw there was a need for potentially a virtualization type appliance. And so between about 99 and 2003, we spent almost four years <laughs> developing the SVC um, product and the kind of architecture and design that went into SVC. SVC is probably the kind of most successful storage virtualization appliance out there um, in the industry today. There's not many other people that, that still have or have made a success like we have of virtualization of, of multiple storage devices behind there. Moving forward um, to 2010 was when we first introduced the Storewise family. And believe it or not, this was actually the first time IBM had ever done a kind of mid-range storage modular type solution. And that took the same SVC concepts and architecture and, and basic software and actually embedded that same RAID functionality from the SSA heritage through the DS8000 in to provide the, the store-wise system itself. 2012, we acquired a company called Texas Memory Systems. So they were founded in 1978. Their marketing tagline was the world's fastest storage. And really their, their products were kind of RAM based. So initially they were producing RAM boxes with battery backup that would allow them to essentially um, pre present persistent storage, but at the speed of RAM. Obviously as Flash came along, then they can 
converted and used Flash as the technology inside there. And we completed the acquisition of them, as I say, in 2012. And it's really that they're all hardware path heritage that then kind of became the first of the Flash system products that we, we branded in 2014. So taking that Texas memory system um, kind of technology, turning it into a, a, the IBM 840 was the first product in 2014. So then we get to much closer to kind of where we are today. So in 2018, we then took a lot of that kind of flash core technology that they had, these micro latency modules inside those flash system boxes that had come, as I say, from that Texas memory system product and built those into NVMe devices that we put inside the flash system. And the, the first product to use that was the 9100 in 2018. So, uh, Barry, um, would you mind to, uh, well, I remember from, from our uh, podcast, uh, um, like last month and uh, from the announcement early this year. So lots of things changed for this year, right? So can you tell us a little bit more about the, the new flash system range? Absolutely. So, so for those of you that have obviously been using store wise products, maybe for a year, for the last 10 years or so, um, we made a branding change earlier this year so this was announced back in february um, and what was the store wise 5000 and 7000 range have now all become flash system products as well um, so you'll see a kind of decoder ring at the top there um, or a table really um, that shows the the old store wise name and then obviously the new flash system name so the main thing, main difference, um, the kind of next generation in the 7,000 was actually moved to a 7,200 in the name. The 9110 as a product um, hasn't been kind of replaced really. If you were looking at the 9110, the 7,200, the, certainly the new one would be more powerful than the previous 9110 was. And then the high end is now the 9,200. What's not listed on there, and you'll see in the in the little purple um, diagram, is there is now also a 9200R. So the idea here of the the whole flash system family is that it's one set of products right from the kind of entry, kind of as it says, entry enterprise level there, all the way up to the kind of high end enterprise and into cloud as well. And we'll talk about that as we go through. So really, the the one of the values is. You choose the, the horsepower, if you like, all of the features and functions and capability are pretty much there across the entire range. Um, but it's a, a common family right from the, the 5010 all the way up to the, the 9200. Okay, th well, uh, thanks for that. So uh, for people that don't know much about uh, the value of Flash system, <laughs> well, uh, Barry have had lots of free time to think about these during the lockdown. So now he came up with a very cool thing called it the 5F for Flash system. So Barry, can you run us uh, through what are the 5Fs? Uh, well, beginning with the the first one, flexible. So, so why would you describe our uh, our um, f flash um, portfolio as flexible? Okay. So, um, as I sort of mentioned, it's it, the the range goes the whole way from entry, um, but still obviously enterprise class. I mean, these are all designed. The heritage is important to understand here that these have all come from combinations of DS8000 and SVC technology combined with the um, TMS products as well to produce essentially enterprise class products um, at different kind of entry points. So gives you that flexibility to, to pick and choose, but have the same capabilities. So that same what's now called Spectrum Virtualize software that runs across the entire family. So Spectrum Virtualize is the, the software that started out as the SVC product and has obviously now grown and is run across um, the whole set of products. But not only just from a kind of which product do you buy, but within each one of those individual um, systems, you can obviously configure them to suit um, the needs that you have. So small businesses, obviously maybe a 5,000 series is the right thing, but you might need to grow. You maybe want to add more capacity in there. You may want to add more performance capability. And so clustering is at the heart of this, being able to 
take multiple individual boxes and present them as a single management interface with all of the capacity and all of the performance. So as you add and cluster these things, so you're kind of doubling the performance capability that you have inside them. Um, expansion enclosures can be added, so maybe you just you don't need more horsepower, but you maybe need more capacity there. You might have differing needs in the capacity, so it's great if we can all afford to put all NVMe-based flash modules into a solution, but a lot of the time you have different workloads that maybe that price point isn't the right point to put in. So maybe some SAS SSD just to get kind of medium flash performance or even big nearline SAS kind of archive type storage capacity that you might want to put in there. Most of, or almost all of the, the kind of common um, fabric connectivities there. So you've got your standard fiber channel networks, we've got iSCSI, we've got iSER. So iSER is a kind of RDMA protocol using iSCSI as a basis, but getting rid of all the problems that iSCSI had with the, the kernel overheads and the, the the kind of issues you have of doing the, the DMA basically is a, a RDMA-like protocol. And obviously we can do NVMe over fiber channel for those new infrastructures that are going on there. But not only that, most people maybe want to do some kind of um, disaster recovery protection as well. And so the replication functionality can be between any of the members of the family. So maybe in production, you have a, a 9200R kind of high end system, but you maybe want to have multiple sites. So you might have a DR site, you can put in one of the other boxes, a 7200. Maybe you even have compliance reasons why you might need to have a third site. Obviously, maybe it doesn't need to have the performance there, you just need the capacity. And so putting a 5100 there. So all of those things. Um, kind of build into that as well as obviously the, the the software functionality. So I kind of mentioned this that it's based on Spectrum Virtualize, the the, the beating heart of every flash system, the, the software and the capability that's inside there. I'm not going to go through that whole list. These these slides will be available after, but just putting it in simple terms all of the modern functionality that you'd expect to find in a storage system, giving you the vol volume management capabilities with data reduction, with simple tiering, with all of the clustering, all of those capabilities, all of the standard DR and HA, HA um, technologies, so synchronous, asynchronous, snapshot-based synchronous replication, as well as high availability options such as hyperswap and our enhanced stretch cluster on the SVC side. And then all of the point in time or snapshot copies um, with our flash copy technology, giving you mechanisms to take um, very thin provisioned, um, low cost um, point in time copies of volumes for maybe dev test purposes or for backup purposes. And more recently as well, tiering into the cloud. So enabling you to take snapshots and store them as objects on S3 capable storage, um, providing potentially a, a, um, a mutable copy on S3 immutable storage with, with AWS, which gives you a cyber resiliency solution as well. And the, sitting off to the side of that, and we'll talk about it as we go through, is our storage insights. Um, cloud-based portal for managing and also analyzing the storage as well. As I say, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through. Okay, thanks for that. So it's, it's uh, really flexible, let's put it this way. Um, what about the second F? Second F, Fast. okay. So, so yeah. I, I, I know that fast <laughs> goes without saying, but uh, um, flash is fast, period. But, what is so fast about our flash system technology? Okay. So unfortunately, this is a really boring slide um, <laughs> if we talk about something. But needless to say, flash is fast, obviously. We've we've come from the days of hard drives where we worried about the, the spinning and we were talking in in multiples of milliseconds and tens of milliseconds. Flash has taken us down into the millisecond world or BO millisecond. But we're now getting to the point with NVMe that we can get down to the tens of microseconds as well. Now you may say, okay, everybody has very similar um, kind of capabilities there. We're all going to be doing that, but you've got to take it back to the, okay, how can we get the absolute best out of this? How can we make sure 
that the hardware side is giving us the, the lowest possible latency. So again, building on that TMS um, hardware heritage where those original boxes were a 100% hardware path, there was no firmware, no software running in there. And so we've taken that and we've kind of built that in to our exclusive NVMe drive modules, which again, we'll talk about in a minute. But it's also about the ratio of cores. So if you think of the, the capabilities of hundreds of thousands of IOPS off of a single device, off of a single drive today, means that you need a lot of CPU resource and a lot of memory resource to actually drive those. So the ratio is in the high-end boxes is more than two and a half Xeon cores just to, to run a single NVMe drive. So that's how much CPU resource there is built into there. We can have up to 756 gig of cache per node, so one and a half terabytes in a kind of standard in, um, to you deployment. Um, lots of fiber channel, 32 gig fiber channel ports, so 24 32 gig fiber channel ports in a single controller as well. And then if that's not enough for you, then you can cluster up to four of these systems or eight nodes together to provide four times the performance of a single one. Um, Industry leading performance capabilities, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So up to 2.25 million IOPS per rack U. Now that's a cache number. Now you've got to be careful because almost every vendor will quote just cache numbers. But to give you the realistic number, up to 1.25 million IOPS from 24 drives. So 24 NVMe, um, or these NVMe drive modules, 1.25 million IOPS coming from, from just that and up to 48 gigabytes a second from 24 of those drives as well. All of that while driving 70 microsecond latency. So these really are kind of the, some of the highest numbers in the industry, the lowest latency in the industry, um, and the ability to scale out the, the systems. Now, I think, yeah, so as I say, that's the, the fast piece. Um, and those are the numbers. So at that 2.25 million IOPS number, when we're talking cash, it's the only thing we really have to compare against some of the competition. So latency is a fairly easy one. If we look at that, 70 microseconds off of the flash system, all the other vendors, major vendors are quoting 100 microseconds. So 30% faster straight away on the latency. On the bandwidth side, if we're looking at comparing against the, the Pure X90, their single box is 18 gigabytes a second. Here we're 45 gigabytes a second. So two and a half times more bandwidth. And if you cluster four of those together, then that's 180 gigabytes a second. So 10 times higher. Comparing against PowerMax 8000, and this is really where the it comes into not only the, the kind of IOPS, but the IOPS density. So if we put that into um, the, the amount of space needed Obviously, four of these 2U controllers gives us eight rack U to give us 18 million IOPS cache number. The equivalent with the PowerMax is 80 rack U, so almost two full rack units to get 15 million IOPS. So there, if you put it into IOPS per rack U, 187K versus 2.25 million. So truly is faster. And then the final comparison there again, against the, the A800 NetApp series. So 11.4 million and 48U, obviously slightly less rack space, but still nine times better when you compare that with a, um, the, the flash system. Well, that's that's really impressive, Barry. Uh, and, uh, I, and I reckon that, well, I, I think that most of these advantages that we have compared to our our other vendors on, on Flash is uh, from our architecture and also because our next F, which is FCM. So uh, as you mentioned, and uh, as we know, uh, uh, this is unique uh, um, stuff that we have under under our products, right? So can, can you describe those FCMs? How, how is that uh, unique? Sure. So not all NVMe drives are equal. So NVMe obviously as a, as a new drive connectivity technology is great because it gives us a PCI lane basically, or a pair of PCI lanes straight into the storage device. So meaning we can cut out essentially the middleman, which used to be the SAS adapter. Um, when we were talking SAS SSDs, 
And so the CPU can talk directly to the device and kind of DMA directly onto the devices. So that's NVMe, and that's what you get with industry standard NVMe drives. The flash core modules and the flash core technology is a direct kind of mapping of that hardware path technology from the TMS um, boxes into the device itself. So there's no firmware as such that runs on these. There's a big FPGA, field programmable gate array, that basically turns the logic into gates. And so it's running at a 100% at hardware path inside the FCM. Why does that make a difference? Well, it means we can add an inline hardware compression algorithm. So the same algorithm that's used on the on the Z mainframe side of things and it's been used for years. That algorithm implemented in hardware means we can run compression on the flash core module while maintaining that 70 microseconds. So compression and encryption are always on on these devices. All of the quoted performance numbers there are with compression running. And we can pretty much guarantee two to one compression, assuming the data is compressible. So we have four different sizes. We introduced a new extra large module at the start of this year, a 38.4 usable capacity, but a huge capacity, 88 terabytes. So we can store up to 88 terabytes on a single two and a half inch drive, giving you hundreds of thousands of IOPS off the device while doing compression and encryption. Oh, that's that's high density of performance i agree slightly scary in some some aspects some people might say having that much data on a single device but that's why we recommend to always use d-raid 6. um so those i have the t-shirt by the way yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those gen 2 flash core modules um are as i say they're, they're kind of the second gen so we introduced the first generation back in 2018 when we introduced the 9100 um but they have Nine, they're using the 96 layer micron flash. Um, they're getting higher IOPS and lower latency than the Gen 1, even though they're using the latest generation kind of smaller and more dense flash modules. But they've also added in what we're calling this smart data placement or this. So the read heat awareness allows us to basically build a dynamic and what we're calling pseudo SLC cache. So without spending 20 minutes talking about SLC, MLC, TLC, QLC, the different types of flash give different performance. So SLC, single level cell that we had 10 years ago, gave you the best performance and the best endurance. The kind of TLC and QLC technologies that are around now give you less performance and have less endurance. But by analyzing the data and understanding just as our easy tier technology that we'll mention later, inside the device it monitors how hot particular blocks of data are and for the things that are being read a lot we will move them onto some space that we reformat as slc so although the underlying technology may be tlc or qlc it's pseudo slc so it reformats it to look like slc and we get that better performance so we can basically tier within the device based on the data that's going on. And that same heat algorithm has been used to do the wear leveling and right amplification reduction as well. So if anyone wants to hear about that, I think we talked a lot more about that in your in your podcast that we did, Abilio. There's lots of details in there if people want to know more about that. Yeah, I can pop up that on, on the... Um uh on the q a uh, later on so no worries about that uh yeah let's let's move to to the next f it's not a real f but yeah it's valid so friendly user friendly what makes our flash system unique on this space sure so the the original design goal that we were given and this this has kind of evolved from the, the store wise products when we put them together one of our um executives at the time came to the, to me to the talk to us in development and said i want this user interface to be so easy that even i could use it and so that was the design kind of ethos that we had for the user interface gone are the days of having to cut files and have uh, a degree in computer science to be able to actually manage and create your storage devices so you can see just an example there of the um the, the actual um interface so you get dashboard 
dashboard views, showing you the performance, showing your capacity utilization, quickly highlights you to any issues with the system health information that's in there. And it's really designed to hide complexity. So the complexity is always there. If you want to be able to delve in and you do have a degree in computer science and you want to go in and change all the bells and whistles yourself, then all of that is available. There are advanced panels where you can get access to all of the different um, tunable parameters. But for the for your average user, just being able to click and say, I want a new volume, I want this capacity, boom, and it's away, away it goes and it's done. Um, also, at the same time, we do have our full command lines, full se secure shell based uh, command line that you can then script everything through if that's the way you want to go and all of the usual plugins for REST APIs, VMware um, integration, OpenStack, CSI drivers, all of those things to enable it to connect and be integrated into whatever management interfaces you're, you're actually using. And on top of that, we also have our cloud portal for managing um, the system with our cognitive support side as well, which is called Storage Insights. So Storage Insights, this is um, basically an entitled um, piece of our capability or software um, that anyone who's an IBM storage customer has access to. Um, and there's a couple of different versions of this, depending on which way you're, you're going. If you have our SRM management tool with Spectrum Control, then you get, can get access to the full pro version, or you can license this on a monthly basis. But at a basic level, everybody gets the, 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 the main dashboard view, which gives you the, the health of the systems. It will do some basic analytics on your systems and provide you with warnings, hopefully proactive warnings um, prior to things maybe happening or becoming an issue. Um, this is data, uh, I'm not sure if the particular client is actually online today in this session, but I stole these from them. The names have been changed to protect the guilty. Um, so this is a, an example of what you would see when you log into Storage Insights. So all of your IBM storage systems with the current firmware and whether there's any errors and making sure that the probes are running. You've got the various tabs to look at alerts and performance and capacity reporting. Um, and then once you delve into a, a, a particular system, you get access to see um, a kind of overview, the dashboard views, what's my current performance looking at, like what's my um, capacity, how well am I doing, and you can delve into all the details. But really it's more on the cognitive support and the advisor side. So you can see here, again, this is off a real system. Um, these are things that the that Insights has analyzed based on the data that's been sent back to, to IBM to say, actually, you, you might be um, storing yourself up for a problem here. For example, our easy tier that we mentioned um, is our tiering technology. It needs some free space um, to be able to roam and be able to move data around. And here it's detected that there are potentially limited free space. So we've gone through all of our red books um, and we've taken all of our best practice guidance and where, where we can, we've been mapping that into rules and models to, to apply against the customer's data to say, oh, you're, you're potentially violating best practice here, or this is something that, that could cause you a problem in the future. Yeah, and that's really, uh, I would like to highlight, Barry, if you don't mind, uh, the importance of uh, um, uh, of this type of feature because it is not only management, right? So when you say management, uh, sometimes it means more work to do. And uh, the idea of management is actually putting the machine to do the work for you. So proactivity is the name of the game here, right? So a storage insights can give you that. So well, it's, that's that's pretty 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 good. Um, moving on for the for the next F, future proof. Uh, yeah, well, how can that be future proof? Tell me. Sure. So obviously things change, things move forward, but we try and make this as, as future proof as possible. So building on that history with Spectrum Virtualize, it's been 16 years since we first introduced that software in SVC. There's been 35 or more major software updates, and each one of those brings new business features or new functions into the into the capability. Obviously, some of those boxes that were sold 16 years ago have probably long time gone out of support, and so some of those earlier ones are no longer supported, but we try not to cut 
any of the software support on some of the older boxes. As long as things are still in the support cycle, then the new versions of software will be supported on those and bring you those new, new capabilities sort of almost in, included in the price kind of thing when you first purchase them. So the software side, obviously, we can add more function, we add more capability, and you just pick that up when you upgrade to the new new version of the software. But also the, the ability to expand. So we, we can now, if you start small, maybe you only need, I mean, the size of those devices that we were talking about earlier, you might only need to put 12 drives in to get the capability. But maybe in six months' time, you need to add another drive. So the ability to expand your existing um, RAID array without having any disruption to service, just add the drive in and the data gets restriped across it. Expanding out through clustering, so different generations of the products can be clustered together. So if you have a, a 7000 today and you buy a 7200, you can cluster that together. So making sure that the, the investment that you've made on day one is 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 held forward and can, can be expanded upon. Obviously, as people are looking to potentially integrate more into um, cloud workloads as well and cloud environments, then as your future maybe heads in that direction, if you have something Spectrum Virtualized based um, on premise, then you can look at Spectrum Virtualized for public cloud and we'll talk about the various use cases for that in just a moment. And then obviously new storage class memory technologies. Those boxes back in 2018, when we introduced those, we classed them as SCM ready. And obviously now we have those 3D cross point or those Z uh, SSD devices that you can buy and put into um, your your store your solutions today. So two year old box, but you can still buy um, those new devices and put them in and give yourself a boost. And we we support the two different technologies there. Those SCMs are available as Intel Optane devices or as the Samsung Z SSD devices. Fairly small capacities compared to what we were talking about earlier, um, but they're not particularly cheap as well, but these things are down to kind of 10 microsecond latencies with potentially hundreds of thousands, up to half a million IOPS off of a single device. So another reason for needing all of those CPU cores and all of that memory bandwidth inside the box to be able to utilize some of these new technologies that are coming along. Yeah, I, I was going to to uh, ask you uh, because uh, lots of my clients are, are looking to explore a little bit uh, about cloud. So, uh, can this help a little uh, on that one? Absolutely. So, that same piece of software that's running inside the flash system, the Spectrum Virtualize, we you can extract that software piece and then run that in a cloud environment. So today on the IBM cloud and on um, AWS. So. Why would you want to do that? Why? Well, the first thing is that you maybe not realize is once you get some block storage in your cloud environment, they don't have any of the capabilities that you're used to having on premise. So you don't have thin provisioning, you don't have deduplication, you don't have snapshots or any of those kind of things. So the first thing you can do is actually save money if you're using block based storage in the cloud by putting Spectrum Virtualize to manage it you can start using thin provisioning. So instead of having to fully allocate volumes up to your um, your data center or your, your hosts in the cloud environment, you can actually just provision what they need. And as they write data, it will consume storage, but it won't be hardwired and hard allocated to those. The same goes now that we've added deduplication capability in there as well. You can start deduplicating the data on that cloud storage. So that's the, just the first use case if you already have some data in the, in the cloud. Um, okay. You can obviously extend um, your on-premise um, into um, the hybrid cloud. So um, by doing using this as a data migration tool, you can obviously move data, uh, whether it's temporarily or permanently, um, into a cloud environment, um, giving you consistent management interfaces. So you're just using your on-premise Spectrum Virtualize, sending it across into the cloud environment. And you may want to do that long term, and that would be the third use case there, the business continuity. So having your DR site as a cloud data center site where you're copying your data on a daily basis from on-premise into the cloud environment, um, and then should something happen to your local data center, then obviously they're bringing up and attaching to that data that's already there. Um, and then the protection and data um, of data in public cloud. So maybe you want to actually uh, 
duplicate data between multiple clouds. So you already have some of your workloads running out there in a cloud environment, but you're at the mercy of if something happens to that cloud environment, you maybe need a, another copy of the data. Maybe you want to hedge your bets and run it across multiple different vendors' clouds as well. And so by using Spectrum Virtualize for public cloud, we can we can move data between clouds as well. Okay. Um, well, th thanks for that. So um, I, I reckon that's that's really clear. Um, uh, the the value of, of uh, that we have unique on flash systems. Uh, so uh, if you could uh, like a summary uh, summarize uh, um, that those five Fs and in a. Uh, one minute and then we can jump on uh because i i i'm curious to see some use case that we we can uh use this technology on that one so uh, if you don't mind so just a sure. brief summary on the on the uh, on the five f's and then we i would like to to hear from you like where do you suggest us to like normal use case or um, new use case that we didn't think about it yet sure. So we've got the flexibility. We've got the, the whole range of the products from the 5,000 up to the 9,000, um, all of the features and functions in there, the capability to do DR, HA, expand up the boxes as we move forward. They are fast. They're the fastest out there. And that's partly from the FCMs themselves. That technology is fundamental to, to providing the capability we have. The user-friendly interface and the ability to obviously have that same interface running in a cloud environment if you want and allowing you to move data into the cloud and pick up new technologies are all the, the five s that I, I came up with for today so you said about some use cases and that's exactly um kind of a, a couple of things so so let's start with a, a kind of traditional workload use case so this is your kind of two data center design you have your primary site and your disaster recovery site um, maybe you're, you're requiring a good few um, hundred thousand IOPS from the system. It's quite a big environment. Then you possibly put in a clustered flash system 9200, and then that's going to be having your traditional workloads running on there. So by that, we mean database servers, email servers, possibly like a VMware farm running all your ESX servers. So all of those running locally, and then, of course, we can... I believe you know better than me about Spectrum Protect Plus. Um, we can use that to to do all of your kind of backup and, and recovery within the VMware systems as well. We can we can pull mm -hmm. data in and out of the individual guests um, using Spectrum P Protect Plus. So maybe that's your kind of on premise um, pieces. But you want to make sure that should something happen to your primary site, you can get back up and running without any data loss. And so your secondary site is fairly close. We're running synchronous re replication. But there, you want to make some use of that as well. You, you don't want it just to be sat there as a kind of like dark bunker site. Um, you're spending all this money on a solution. And so maybe you put in a 7200 because you're not going to be running everything from there if you ever had to actually um, cut over to that and use that. You might be able to help only run a subset of your services. So 7200 would be capable of doing that. But you also want to use it as a kind of archive and backup type target as well. And so maybe you put in some of the high density expansion enclosures with some nearline SaaS devices attached in there as well for your long, long term archive solution. So you have backup servers set there ready to take over in the event. Um, that something happens, but also you've now got a copy of your data there. You've essentially got everything running there. So why don't you run your dev test environment over there? And then you can use our CDM, our copy data management to manage taking very thin or space efficient snapshots of that copy of data that you already have there and spin that up for dev test workloads for your, your pr production development for your, your next application that's going on. And then all of that being managed or monitored and advised on by storage insights as well. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, any 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 new workload type of thing that you may suggest? Yep. So um, kind of modern workloads. So 
probably lumping VMware in there. I know it's not quite so modern these days, but um, obviously VMware with virtual machines probably running a large part of most people's environments. And then we're seeing people move more into the kind of open shift type world with containers and Kubernetes and um, all of those kind of workloads. So we have a CSI driver that you can use for, to provide stateful storage into your container um, environment. But maybe this is only your, your, you only have one data center here, but it's just as important to be able to have um, a backup of data as well. So maybe the 5100 is the right thing. You might want to expand that and have some multiple tiers of storage again there, but SAS based SSDs are good enough for some for a second tier of storage. So expand up the capability with that. But you want to, as I say, have um, a, a DR capability. And so utilizing Spectrum Virtualize for public cloud um, allows you to obviously use the native block storage that's provided out there in the cloud environment and tie into that. Well, the nice thing with this workload is maybe if you're not actually going to be using um, the servers on a daily basis or anything, you can just spin up the, the servers themselves. So only when you need them. So normally you're just running on your, your production site, but it may be that for some reason you have to cut over then at that point, you you lease some more servers, you you spin those up, and you attach them to the copy of the data that you have there through the, the cloud service. Similarly, if you just want to do some temporary dev test type workload, maybe you spin up those servers uh, for a short period of time. Again, you could use CDM to actually make those copies of the, the data tied into the, um, the cloud copy. Um, and then giving you that flexibility to only access those or only pay for those resources when you need them but the the peace of mind that your data is all still safe and copied across there and again storage insights can manage all of that so it can manage both the local on-premise and give you visibility into the public cloud version of spectrum virtualize as well oh great uh great thank thanks for that uh barry i reckon that that, that is clear uh, some 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 use cases. So uh, I reckon that uh, we we could open for uh, our Q and A answer, uh, um, Q and A session. I mean, uh, part of the, the the session. Let's see. A bit, a bit, yeah. There's been quite a few actually. It's been quite good. Thank you very much to Mr. Greenfield for answering some on the, the Q and A chat as we've been going along. Our first one came from the um, flexibility foil. Um, if we whip right back to there, the question was, uh, what is simple reverse ops? And it was in the last column of the... So, the, so um, snapshots, um, when you take a, a point in time copy, um, a lot of the time, maybe you know, it, easiest to describe with a use case. So um, you've got a database, you're about to run some kind of table reorg or some kind of low level change to the database. So you take a snapshot. You don't actually obviously copy anything at the point the snapshot's created, but you've now got a backup essentially of that. You run the, the change to your database and something goes horribly wrong. So you want to actually roll back to the, the snapshot copy that you took. It's a simple option just to to click on the snapshot that you took and say reverse, and that instantly sends starts copying anything that was changed back, um, but it's accessible instantaneously. So that's the key thing. So straight away you can bring the database back up in in its original form. Excellent, thank you. Um, can you use the new Gen two FCMs? In a Gen One FS ninety one hundred. Yes, so there is um, their standard NVMe um, attachment, and um, there's nothing to stop you from from putting them into either. Excellent. Yes, is always a very good answer. Yeah. <laughs> we had a question regarding replication. Um, surely the performance of replication will be restricted to the lowest performance unit. So when you mentioned having maybe a tertiary site with a 5100 mm -hmm. added versus a 92 or a 72, um, I would personally, that would matter if it was synchronous replication. However, asynchronous replication would be different. Can we comment on that? Sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, sorry. 
I'm sure you all know the, that your kids come and interrupt you. <laughs> Sorry, the, um, there's a question regarding the replication performance. Yep. Surely the capability is restricted by the lowest performing unit. So you said we can replicate from a 92 to a 51 or 72 to something else. So would the replication be determined by the performance of the lowest unit? So potentially, if you were, obviously you need to size it and make sure that um, it's going to be able to cope with it. But in the example I had where it was a 92 going to a 72, then going to a 51, um, first of all, it's only obviously the right workload that's get, getting replicated across. So all of your reads that are happening in production aren't going to be targeting there. So you're going to reduce the workload initially um, to there. And then with the third site, it's actually a kind of point in time based copy there. And so the RPO is much longer. And so it doesn't really matter how long it takes for the third site to eventually catch up. It will eventually get there. So it depends on which type of replication. If you're doing truly synchronous replication, then it's obviously it's very important to make sure whatever the target is, is going to be able to cope with whatever your peak right workload is. So sizing is important. Absolutely. Okay. What else have we got? Um, just a marketing point, I think, was uh, the uh, the power consumption per IOP must be a better ratio than it would be with uh, spinning disks or SSD, obviously with FCMs. However, we do have a comment that we do have rather grunty power supplies in those boxes still. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of discussion always came along about SSDs being more power efficient than hard drives. The reality is when you think about it, you've got a 25 watt device now. These are these are PCIe connected devices um, with lots of um, technology in there. So it's the the power supplies, I think, are two kilowatts. We've got two two kilowatt power supplies in the back of each of these boxes. And so power and cooling is important for them. Um, so it's maybe not so much. I mean, certainly if you compare it, if you're saying, okay, we can do 2 million IOPS, then the, the power IOPS performance density is, is good compared to what you would have needed to do that with spinning disks, which would have been 40 or 50 racks probably full of spinning disks to get that performance. So definitely performance gains compared to hard drives, but they still use quite a bit of power. We've got a couple of questions relating to um, storage insights. Uh, one one was more of a, you need to give us storage insights pro with this box, um, rather than just the standard and subscribing to pro. Um, is there anything that you know of that we are doing to increase that? Or we can also say that if you have a client that has a spectrum control on a subscription, that also entitles them to use uh, Insights Pro. Yeah, so, so any, on a new, any new license, sale, sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. any license of uh, Spectrum Control that somebody already has automatically entitles them to, to the Pro version of Insights. Um, I know that we are looking at trying to um, sort of almost ensure or at least bake into any potential deals um, Insights Pro just to make sure um, that people have that capability in there, and it's um, a, a point a point noted and understood. Something goes strange there, or is it just me? Oh, it's okay. That's good. Um, that's another okay. one was, can we? Thank you. Something just it sounded like cut off. Uh, can we have five years historical data on Insights Pro? Um. Okay, that's a, something to ask the, the Insights team. I know today, I think it's just 12 months that we have on the historical historical data. So well, these are nice requests for, for additional right. futures yeah. and benefits, which is good. Um, are there public examples of large scale DRP to ward off the pure global DDUPIT scale, especially given the end of line for the XIV slash accelerate code? Interesting question. Any public examples of large scale DRP to ward off the pure global dedupe at scale? I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. Um, so, certainly, we have um, some 
very large customers um, running DRP. Um, with DRP, certainly, hopefully, everyone has seen the the um, the latest eight three one improvements in there. Um, are really making it viable for large scale deployments. I'm not sure if we have any specific uh, public references or use cases. Um, that's something we can look at. Excellent. Um, in your opinion. Of all of the I.O. options available to interconnect to our flash systems, what, in your opinion, would offer the greatest consistent I.O. throughput and why? Uh, it's an easy one. Fibre channel. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, sir, is quite impressive when you, you, when you take your um, snobbery hat off in that it's iSCSI um but it is rdma so it's it's iSCSI got tainted by the fact that everything has to go through the kernel so the 25 gig icer is actually pretty good um is basically equivalent to having 25 gig fiber channel but now we've got 32 gig fiber channel so and you can have four ports in a card so fiber channel is definitely going to be the best um to get the the best performance out of it it's the most mature um probably most people already have an investment in it as well um nvme over fiber channel yep it will give you an advantage of on the host end um it will reduce some of the cpu loading doesn't make a massive difference at the storage end um but yeah um npiv with fiber channel running into the flash system with flash core modules will give, will give you the ultimate in performance and hopefully that just answers Steve's comment as well. But that well. Uh, what about comparisons in the market? We have four minutes left. Uh, what about comparisons in the market and flash systems around active-active capability and why that's important uh, against compared to one of our competitors I can think of? And also with hyperswap for multi-site high availability, what are the advantages we have in specific? Okay. Um, so difficult to go into kind of specific advantages. I mean, the, the full high availability capability is there. Um, it's been there for, for some years, obviously evolved from the stretch cluster systems on the, the SVC into hyperswap. Maybe we need to, if there's enough demand for these sessions, maybe we need to have a separate hyperswap um, high availability type session because it's a, a big topic to cover. Certainly not four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. It is a good one, yeah, but yes, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, indeed. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll look at that one as well. Um, I'd like to see IBM use. Well, I think this is probably the last one I can see. I'd like to use see IBM use one of the additional IP ports to provide a separate remote support access to bring remote code loads to the product, like the XIV did. Okay, so we don't. I mean, we can do remote code loads, um, but. Obviously, you don't have to get a dedicated port for doing that, but you can open up um, and give um, IBM support personnel access um, to do remote code upgrades. But as I guess the point here is having a dedicated port to do it on a kind of different network, if you like. So, yeah, good point. Yeah, but and another, I think our last one would be, um, it's it's more network related and, and we've kind of covered it already, but it was that any intention to have insights in a private capacity, many customers can't utilize it due to security concerns. So I, my answer to that would be spectrum control on-prem. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yep. exactly. Absolutely. So yeah, so you had it for a long time and it hasn't been used. So uh, having insights um, control hasn't gone away. Okay, I think pretty much there's a couple of messages in there that uh, that Andrew answered directly on our behalf, um, and they, I think they've been answered directly to the people. So I'm happy with that. Um, if there's an, anything else I can think of? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, to I Andrews just would like to yeah question, question mastering Andrews. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a luxury to have him uh, uh, answering our questions, eh? Ah. We are rocking. Um, okay, can I wrap up the session? Um, I think so. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, well, um, thanks guys for for joining the the session. I reckon it was uh, 
It was really good. Uh, Barry, thank you for, for the time and the planning. It was amazing. Andrew, uh, Andrew G, uh, thanks for, for helping us uh, with, with the question. Um, uh, for Andrew Greenfield, uh, much appreciated the, the help and assistance uh, with the questions and showing up in a different time zone. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, to uh, message only. So, uh, Please do the survey that we have uh, right after the event. So that, that is important so we can uh, uh, improve for the next one. So uh, as I said, this is the first one of eight. So one of seven to go. So if you go to the next slide, Barry, just don't forget to register yourself to the next sessions. Um, um, all, all the all the links for the registration uh, um, on the Barry, Barry's blog, so just make sure that you register. Um, the someone asked about the about the the presentation, so we will do a box. Uh, we will do a box sesh, a box folder, so we can uh, put the the presentation there. Uh, yes, we will record it at, um, at the presentation, and uh, we will be. Uh, enabling a link so everybody can watch it again uh, uh, later on. And uh, my que uh, one question to me, yes, I'm working from my kitchen. Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, no, I don't have an office here. So yeah, thanks guys. So We have a poll open, just a very quick one at the end of it to see whether this was valuable, not valuable, very valuable, et cetera. We've got um, a few people have responded. So. If the awesome. last of you are still in there. If you'd like to respond to that poll, if you could, please. And then there'll be a survey, as Emilio said, at the end of it. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And uh, kia kaha mā te wā.